Hey Future Unnaturalists, I'm Emily. And I'm Andy. And we are the hosts of Unnatural, a true crime podcast. Each week, we'll dive into some of the most unnerving crimes that this unnatural world has to offer. Listen for Unnatural on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, make good choices. And don't get got. Bye. Hi, I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. You guys, today's my birthday. I am 31, so if you saw the episode description, you would probably know that this episode is actually about me. Not just me, it also involves somebody from the Stephen Avery case and the Netflix show Making a Murderer. Before we get to that, uh, there is a little bit of news that I want to talk about. Some sad news, if you're from Las Vegas or... Actually, if you're from Nevada, then you know about Lee's Liquors. Lee's Liquors was owned by Kenny Lee. I believe it was founded by his father, who died just about three months ago from uh, pancreatic cancer. Kenny Lee was involved in a car accident last Friday, November 19th. It's unknown exactly what happened, but he apparently veered into oncoming traffic. The other driver involved survived the crash, but Kenny Lee unfortunately did not survive. He was pronounced dead at about 10.25 a.m. He is known for being a loving father, husband, and son. He and his father were very active members of the community. They founded Lee's Helping Hands, which has contributed millions of dollars to charities in Las Vegas, or in Nevada, over the past 20 years. He was an avid golfer and a passionate fan of the Las Vegas Golden Knights. Rest in peace, Kenny, and I wish his family and loved ones light and peace during this difficult time. Now, I'm going to tell you guys a story of my close call. Potentially could have been a true crime, I don't know. But let me tell you about it. No, I'm not a celebrity, but like I said, it does have a connection to making a murderer. It also has to do with how people who hold a certain amount of power or have certain connections can use that power and those connections to lure people with aspirations. So I decided that this is something I want to talk about on the show. Also, because of my birthday, I've been celebrating a lot lately, and I didn't realize that I didn't actually finish researching the case I was planning to do. (laughs) We had a party on Friday night, and we had a great time. There were some musician friends of mine that came over, and they performed for us, and we had a cool little jam session. I uploaded a video or two of us playing, if you want to check it out. It's on my Facebook page under under DD West, so it's facebook.com slash DD West, if you want to give it a follow. Anyway, so instead of leaving you guys hanging for, like, another few days, I figured I'd give you a little bite-sized episode in the meantime while I finish researching the next case. First of all, I am going to use the real name of the guy that this is about. It's not really to bash him, but just in case to bring awareness about him. I mean, in case he contacts someone else like he did to me. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I want to... People should know. Let me give you a little bit of background. So, as you probably already know, I live in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I work as a professional singer. I've worked on shows and musicals along the Strip, and I've fronted a few bands across the valley. So, I'm signed up on a page called Band Mix, which is kind of like a social media platform for musicians to get in touch with each other. I created my Band Mix account years ago. Like, I haven't updated it in forever. It doesn't actually show my the current name I'm going by yet. I I just haven't gotten many good leads on there, so I rarely even use it. Well, I never use it, to be honest. But one day, I got an email telling me that I had received a message on Bandmix. This was from a guy named Ken, and he basically said, I'm putting together an act in Vegas called Live Band Karaoke. We need a female vocalist who can sing all kinds of songs. So if you're looking to get into music, getting a lot of exposure and performing opportunities, this might be a good fit. Hit me up. Let's talk about it. Thanks. Ken. He had left his phone number, so I texted him asking for more information. At first, he seemed legit. He asked me for my email so he could send me the song list and information about the band. This was like a whole slideshow made into a PDF. It had, like, pricing to hire the band and shit. It was almost like what he would give, like, a client. 
So I, I don't know. I'm wondering if he was sending me this shit about the prices and stuff to give me like to show me that the band was legitimate, that they were a working band, but whatever. Anyway, as this guy was sending me the information, he continued to text me. Like this has happened to me before. Like sometimes people are just extra friendly, but I got I got the vibe that this guy was being like too friendly, just a, like a little too personal. Like he was texting me too much for somebody I didn't know. For like for some reason he sent me a couple of pictures of himself. One was him on stage playing playing the guitar. He had like sunglasses on and his hat on backwards. And he sent me another one that was a picture of him and his wife. There was like no context leading up to these pictures. But then he goes, this is my wife, Leah. She was a backup singer in two of my bands, but wants to just chill. Social anxiety steals her joy of performing in public. So now she just supports my bands. At this point, I'm like, I was kind of thinking, dude's a little weird, but let's see where this goes. You know, maybe I'm jumping to conclusions. He wasn't like over the top personal. It was just just little things like that, like sending me pictures of his wife and I wasn't trying to continue the conversation that personally. I was just trying to get back to, okay, when and where's the audition? So I was polite and I just kept asking about it. And he sent me an address and a time. I looked up the address and it's a home address. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, rehearsals sometimes happen in a band member's house, but I don't know this guy or even the names of anybody else in the band. And that was the thing with the brochures and stuff. There was no pictures of the actual band members. There was just like stock images. So I Googled him. And this is like bare minimum for me. My mom tells me to Google anyone I bring to my house or around my kids. So I was like, if I'm going to go to this house, I'm going to look into it. So I dug through our emails and I tried to find his full name. The emails came from Ken Kratz using the email kratzlawfirm at gmail.com. My initial thought was weird, a lawyer in a band, but to be honest with you, I've got a few friends who were musicians and also like realtors or brokers or attorneys, so I guess not that weird. But anyway, I googled Ken Kratz and I kind of figured I wouldn't find much, but I was shocked. There is a ton of information about Ken Kratz on the internet. If that name sounds familiar to you, It's because he was the prosecutor in the Stephen Avery case. So if you happen to see Making a Murderer, it's a docuseries on Netflix. It's all about the case. He is actually also the uncle of Brendan Dassey, who was one of the accused. I won't get into the entire story of of Stephen Avery and Making a Murderer. I'll be honest, I didn't watch it. I tried and I kept falling asleep. And I, I know that might be kind of insensitive, but I'm, I'm just one of those people who falls asleep a lot in front of the TV. I, I can't help it. But basically, it's about a rape. Uh, it's about a crime that was committed. It was a, a woman who was raped and murdered. And Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey were accused. Both were convicted. And I don't know, you know, Stephen was exonerated. Then they try to put him back in jail. It was this whole thing. So this series is basically about how, like, people believe that Ken Kratz and the police department were doing dirty work to try to get a conviction on Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey. It's said that the evidence doesn't actually point towards them at all. So as I said, Ken Kratz was the prosecutor in the case, and he was pretty much made to be the villain of the show. Everyone's convinced that this guy intentionally was trying to put these guys back in prison and keep them there. And like I said, people say that there's no evidence actually pointing to Stephen Avery or Brendan Dassey, but Ken Kratz argues that, well, this show left that stuff out. There is evidence. There's a lot of stuff to point to them that just hasn't been talked about. Anyway, this happened in Wisconsin, so I was sitting there like, what the fuck is this guy doing starting a band in Las Vegas? Then I actually found a Wikipedia page dedicated to Ken Kratz, and while I know that's not like a good source, I decided to look at the citations on the Wikipedia article and then dig a little bit deeper into the claims and see what I could find in, like, court documents and news articles. I also messaged a friend of mine who's into true crime, and she's a little bit of a web web sleuth, just to be like, so I just messaged her to be like, yo, look at this shit. And she couldn't resist but to dig into this guy. Shout out to my friend Mackenzie Erickson. She's the owner of the Ellie and Fig bow shop, and she's also a fellow true crimer. Between the two of us, we found some really scary information. To begin, Ken Kratz resigned from his office in 2010 following a sexting scandal. I guess this was mentioned in Making a Murderer. 
So what happened was he had a female client who was a victim of domestic abuse. They were prosecuting her boyfriend for charges of strangulation. This woman was 26 years old. Apparently, they spoke in his office, and 10 minutes after she left, he started texting her. Over the next two days, he sent her 29 more text messages. So this woman was 26 years old. She went to Ken's office to, you know, talk about her case. Ten minutes after she left, he texted her saying, It was nice talking with you. Feel free to text me between 8 and 4 if you are bored. You have such potential. See ya, Ken, your favorite DA. Then the next morning he said, No text yet today? I'm feeling ignored. Are you even up yet? The woman allegedly replied that she wasn't feeling well, and Ken offered to bring her soup and a margarita, which she declined. At 11.30 a.m. that same day, his text messages got a little more aggressive. He said, I know this is wrong, I am such an honest guy and straight shooter, but I have to know more about you. Are you the kind of girl that likes secret contact with an older married elected DA? The riskier the better? Then he said, Still wondering if I'm worth it? Can I help you answer any questions? She actually tried to shut this down. She said, Why would such a successful, respected attorney be acting like he's in seventh grade? Are you worried about me? She then told him that she wouldn't lie for him and that she was uncomfortable with his behavior. But he was persistent, and he said, You should never lie to me. Obviously, we have talents, and this to offer that the other is intrigued by or you would have called me creepy. You want to accept. I, 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 don't, I, I, don't know, I don't know if I'm reading that right. <laughs> Sorry. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but that's what it says. The next day, when it became clear that she wasn't reciprocating, he started to verbally attack her. He said, It would go slow enough for Shannon's case to get done. Remember, it would be special enough to risk it all. And then when she didn't respond, he said, Hey, miscommunication. What's the sticking point? Your low self-esteem and you fear you can't play in my big sandbox? You may look good at first glance, but women that are blonde, six feet tall, legs and great bodies don't like to be shown off to please their men. I'm the attorney. I have the $350,000 house. I have the six-figure career. You may be tall, young, hot nymph, but I am the prize. His final text came on October 22nd. He said, I would not expect you to be the other woman. I would want you to be so hot and treat me so well that you'd be the woman. Are you that good? The woman reportedly said that she was afraid that if she didn't do what he wanted, he would throw out her whole case. As it turns out, this wasn't the first time Ken did something like this. After those text messages became public, an Oklahoma law student came forward and said that she received similar texts in 2008 after Ken supported her request for a pardon on an old drug charge. This woman says that she met Ken online and that they went to a dinner date. And on this dinner date, he started to tell her details about an ongoing murder investigation in which a woman was believed to have been killed by her boyfriend. She says that he also invited her to go out on a date to the woman's autopsy, provided she act as his girlfriend and wear high heels and a skirt. That's weird, right? Like, he invited a date to an autopsy and told her to wear a skirt and heels? Like, is he... Is he trying to fuck her in the same room as this dead body? Like, this open dead body? Like, uh, A third woman came forward and said that she was harassed via text message. She says that she received several text messages from Ken that escalated into sexual harassment. She said, The reason why I'm coming forward is he abuses his power, not only with women, but with women in certain situations who are extremely vulnerable to his authority. There was another woman that he had prosecuted for shoplifting in 2006. According to a report, it said that in 2009, he called her out of the blue saying that he was getting a divorce, and he came over to her apartment and told her in a threatening manner that he, quote, knew everything about her, and if she didn't listen to him, he could get her jammed up. He told the woman that he ties women up, they listen to him, and he's in control, Ken apparently wanted to engage in bondage with this woman. He instructed her to give him a blowjob, and she did. He then left $75 on her kitchen counter, 
and then he called and texted her 50 or 60 times, leaving angry messages when she ignored him. He allegedly also had a domestic violence victim in 1999, who he was prosecuting her husband, and allegedly put his hand up her skirt. One of these victims, I'm not sure which one, had also said that Ken would say things like, I can have a dominatrix from Chicago uh, come and train you to be more submissive to my advances. Shit like that. Ken Kratz allegedly did not cooperate with the Making a Murderer documentary. Like I said, he says that they left things out and they twisted the story to make him out to be a villain. He has claimed to be suicidal and says that after the release of the series, he started receiving death threats. His Yelp page was flooded with negative comments and everybody was criticizing his tactics about the case. He has spoken out. Um, so he tried not to resign. They made him resign. Um, he actually tried to argue that that was too severe of a punishment. But um, eventually, you know, they were like, yeah, no, this is this is absurd. Like, <laughs> there's no way. So they made him resign. and um, he did make a public statement. I, I'm going to put that on brokenlimelight.com. And there's also another interview that I'm going to upload up there where he admits to being narcissistic and having a sexual addiction. And he also admits to being addicted to drugs like Xanax, Vicodin, and something else. Um, o o opioid painkillers of some sort. So this whole thing happened back in July. Uh, basically, it ended with me texting him saying, Hey, I'm really sorry, but I googled you and I'm not comfortable moving forward. And then I blocked him and I blocked his email and I blocked him on Bandmix because, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to get angry text messages. Me being who I am, I, uh, I posted about this whole situation in a true crime group on Facebook. Honestly, it was probably like a morbid fan group, but I was like, I'm not paranoid, right? I mean, maybe I'm a little paranoid, but also... Like, I, I know how these things can go, and at the end of the day, I, I can totally be okay missing out on this live band karaoke thing. Plus, like, it was really clear that everybody hates him. Like, <laughs> a lot of people hate him, and I don't really think that his name attached to mine would help me, help my career. I mean, his name being associated with mine would probably hurt me a lot. But anyway, so I posted this, and most of the people in the group were super supportive and agreed with me that, you know, better safe than sorry, this guy is an awful creep, and everybody fully believed I was a target. And then one person commented saying, I know Ken personally. All that hype was overblown. The Avery case was the worst thing to ever happen to him. He has made mistakes like other people, but he certainly is no murderer. Ken is very well connected. You may rethink your choice. Okay. Sure. And after that, I'll reach out to Jelaine Maxwell and I'll see if she can get me some connections. And then maybe I'll try R. Kelly. No, but seriously, I just responded politely saying that at the end of the day, it, would, it wouldn't it would help. It would hurt my image. And I'm above all, I'm just not the type of woman to take the side of the accused over the victim. Like, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I'd rather be a rude bitch than a dead bitch. And I'll put that on a t-shirt. Sorry, Ken, but... <sighs> Not worth it. So that's basically the whole story. Um, I looked into it again today, and this band, like I said, this happened back in July, and here we are now in November, and I can't find this band playing anywhere in Vegas. I Like, uh, anywhere. There are, I mean, unless they're under a different name or something, but there is no live band karaoke, at least not with Ken Kratz and not here in Las Vegas. I did find out, though, thanks to Mackenzie, that he apparently was in a band with some other lawyers. I think it's... <laughs> have you guys ever seen... Um, have you seen How I Met Your Mother, where Marshall is in a band full of lawyers, and it's called uh, The Funk, The Whole Funk, and Nothing But The Funk? <laughs> so yeah, he apparently is a, a, a musician, and like I said, he sent me pictures of himself playing guitar. So there you go. This may or may not have become a true crime at the end, but I'm not naive enough to find out the hard way. If anyone else in Las Vegas or anywhere has been contacted by this man the way I have, or like been offered a gig or something like that even by anyone else, send me a message and tell me about it. If you've had any experience like this or even someone posing as somebody with connections, I'd like to hear about it and maybe talk about it on the show. 
I think it was in the in the Marilyn Monroe episode where I talked about a guy who claimed to be a big producer or a Hollywood executive, and he invited her to an audition, and he wasn't anybody. He was just some random creep who tried to attack her. So, like, this is why I wanted to talk about this. It's a real issue, and I just think it's something to keep in mind. It's a scary world out there. Well, I do hope you enjoyed this little episode. I'll do my best to put out a second episode this week. This new episode is about Victor Salva. He is a convicted child molester who went on to create Jeepers Creepers and work with Disney in the film Powder. As always, remember to check out BrokenLimelight.com for updates, additional information for each episode, pictures, merch, shit like that. If you want to get me a birthday gift, I would really love it if you would leave me a positive review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or on BrokenLimelight.com. Or you can send me money for beer at buymeacoffee.com slash ddwest. Okay, thanks for listening. Have a great Deedee's Day. Bye. Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. It's basically like a true crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims. There's evidence for you to evaluate. It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself or you can team up with a buddy or you can do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box. Or if you prefer to be a more high tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt a Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of the proceeds to the Cold Case Foundation, so your purchase actually helps with real life cold cases. The best news is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So go get started now at huntakiller.com and don't forget to use the code BrokenLimelight to get your 20% off. That's Broken Limelight, all one word.